Hey, I'm James from Smoking Dad Barbecue, and today is pulled pork 101 on the Kamado Joe. Now, whether this is your first pulled pork or your hundredth, we're always learning and evolving, and so too has my technique. So I'm gonna pull everything that we've tried into one video so you don't need to go on a goose chase and check out low and slow, hot and fast, low and slow versus hot and fast, foil boat, paper boat, or paper wrap and everything in between. I'm gonna break it all down into chapters so you can, if you're already familiar with some elements, jump to something that might be new or relevant to you. Now, our family loves pulled pork and it's one of the cooks that I recommend is your first five cooks because it's so forgiving and it turns out so delicious. And so this is one, if you're saying, what should I cook first? I don't know. I think should absolutely make your top five. And today we're gonna make it incredibly easy to turn out an amazing pulled pork. Now, as you can tell from this one, this has already got its rub on it because I've done my favorite with large cuts of meat and done an overnight dry brine. And I started with my normal sort of Texas style salt and pepper dry brine, but we've added a couple extra things. We've got mustard, cayenne pepper, smoked paprika. Uh, and I don't even remember at this point. So I'll take you back to yesterday, show you the exact rub that we made up for an overnight dry brine, because we're going for some sweet heat in our pulled pork. Then when you rejoin me uh, current day, uh, we'll build our fire. And I'm gonna show you, since I've actually got a couple errands on the go, how to build a foolproof fire that will be set it and forget it and hold exactly the temperature that we want, even if we can't be tending to our fire for a couple hours. So I'll see you in a couple minutes when we're ready to get this pork on. So pork is incredibly forgiving. We don't need to be too precise, but for those who are measuring along the fill line on the bottom cap here is exactly three tablespoons. So I'm gonna use that to measure our salt and pepper. Let's start with some pepper. All right, that looks perfect. That looks almost right to that fill line. So let's get that three tablespoons of pepper in. You notice versus our brisket, I'm going for a much finer mesh. That's so that everything, when we shake this together, the pepper and the other spices don't separate. So I've gone for a finer mesh. Next, we'll add our salt. And since we're gonna mix our Diamond Crystal Kosher salt and our Lowry's, I'm gonna go for about two thirds of volume for our Diamond Crystal Kosher and the last third are Lowry's. Looks good, let's mix that in. Next, I'm gonna go for about three quarters of a tablespoon of garlic, about three quarters of a tablespoon of dried yellow mustard, about a tablespoon of paprika, adjust to your family's heat preference, but about a half to three quarters tablespoon cayenne pepper, and then about a tablespoon of brown sugar. And our pork rub is ready. So we're ready to dry brine our pork with the rub that we just made up. The only other things that you may want, just napkins to help clean up as well as to pat our pork dry. That'll just help reduce the time of making sure that that salt is the only thing pulling out moisture to help our rub stick as a natural binder. And it'll help get a nice Maillard reaction in terms of how the smoke's going to penetrate this roast tomorrow. Okay, we're getting ready to dry brine our pork shoulder. The only other things you may want or need are some paper towels just to help pat this dry so that we can get our dry brine rub on. Some nitrile gloves, just make it easier to ha uh, handle things uh, and keep ourselves clean. And then I like to score the top of our roast. So we're just going to use a knife and put a cross hatch pattern in. Let me bring you nice and close. We'll get our pork shoulder ready to hit the fridge overnight. So that will just open up a little bit more surface area for smoke and our rub to stick to. Also allow that fat cap as it renders just to fall down into those pockets. Add some nice texture and character to our rub. So let's start by seasoning the bottom and we'll finish on our presentation side. Work that rub down into those crevices that we created with scoring. That looks ready for the refrigerator. So I've already got our Big Joe cleaned out from our last cook, which judging by the amount of leftover fuel on that brisket worked out to be just the right amount. So like always, I'm gonna place one or two smoking chunks. These are peach wood. I'm gonna to stick to peach and apple today for our pulled pork. We'll place these right on the bottom. And then we're gonna cover it up with some new charcoal. Okay, so give you a look here in the basket. We're about half full of capacity. There's, I can put my hand all the way down to the basket 
in the front, but you'll notice there's a slight sort of skew towards the back. And I find that in a Kamado, the natural burn direction of the charcoal is towards the back. So if we were to put that all to the sides or all to the front, the fire may work its way from the coal. So I like to build sort of a little mound in the middle that sort of tapers off towards the back. That's gonna make sure we have plenty of fuel for today's cook. Let's grab our grill blazer grill gun, fire this up. Lots of ways you can start your fire, but this gets the job done nice and quick. So I'm gonna concentrate the fire here. If you're replacing cubes, I'd place a fire starter right here and right here. So again, we're gonna get that fire working to the back. If you're using something like I'm using, a grill torch, we're gonna concentrate our fire front center. Let's fire this up. So in elapsed time, that was about one minute. You can see we've got those coals ashing over. And just for a reference, it's 10, 16 in the morning here. So we'll time how long this actually takes to get our grill up to temperature after that one minute of lighting. Our bottom vent is all the way open. Let's close our dome and open our top vent all the way. I'll get you right back to the action in a minute, but it's time to thank Trade Coffee for sponsoring today's video. You already know I'm a fan of Kamado Joe, but I'm also a big fan of a cup of Joe, especially if you've seen some of my early morning cooks, you'll see me wandering around uh, with a cup of coffee to help wake up and make sure I have sort of the energy and the warmth to present the video topic. But just like I've discovered lately with spices, that fresh ground makes a world of difference in flavor. I've discovered the exact same thing not too long ago with my coffees and I was equally blown away with the difference that freshness makes with the aroma and most importantly, the taste. So as you can probably tell from my warm outer clothing or sometimes snow on the ground that I'm not fortunate enough to live in an area where fresh coffee is grown and harvested. Instead, I often rely on my local grocery store where I don't know how long it's been sitting on the shelf, let alone do I necessarily know what type of coffee I might like. So I often fall in a bit of a rut, just kind of going for the old tried and true. This is where I was blown away by the coffee quiz that trades develop that helps sort of go through a series of questions to match you with a perfect coffee for your individual taste. And they're so confident in this quiz and it worked for me, I'm sure it worked for you, that if you're not absolutely satisfied with your first bag, they'll exchange it free of charge. When today's video is done, you're not gonna wanna miss this because right now, Trade is offering a total of $20 off your first three bags when you go to drinktrade.com slash sdbarbecue or click the link down below in the description. That's more than 16 cups of coffee for free. That's drinktrade.com slash SD barbecue for $20 off your first three bags. Now, back to the action. Okay, here we are. It's just about six minutes later and I'm feeling some heat in the dome. So I wanna start adding the uh, rest of our double indirect setup. Let me show you how to do that. First, we're gonna drop in the base of our slow roller, then the top portion of our slow roller. Then our divide and conquer rack. Next, our X accessory ring, our heat deflector plates. And if you're doing this, you don't have a slow roller and you are doing this on a series one or series two, uh, what you would do is you put your deflector plates in the low position and then instead put a pizza stone on your X accessory rack. It works just as well. I've actually tested that on a chicken video and there was something like 100 degrees different between the stone, the first set of stones and the second set of stones and then again, hotter by your fire. So that double indirect works just as well. You don't need a slow roller to play along. Next is my Smokeware 14 inch drip pan. And since pulled pork and brisket, things like that push out a lot of rendered tallow, I find it's just easier to clean up to cover it in foil. So I've covered that in foil. We'll place that right in the center. And our cooking grids, we will push against the notches so they're good and secure, don't go anywhere. Close that up. Okay, so you could see our core temperature dropped but is rising quite quickly. So to slow things down, I'm gonna close our top which is going to help trap more of that heat in our dome and leave it on the fourth line. And we're gonna close our bottom draft door down to one finger. Okay, it is now exactly 10 
minutes after we turned off our grill torch. And so we've got our double indirect setup and the rest of our grill is just stabilizing. Stabilizing means that slow roller and our deflector plates and grids, everything that didn't have any temperature is warming up. That's going to slow down the progress of the grill, but then it's going to quickly start racing ahead once those things come up to temperature. And this is normally a stumbling block for many people setting up for a low, slow cook. And since I'm going away for the next couple hours, we want to get this right and make sure that we land at our temperatures and hold nice and steady. And so the best way to do that, I find, is to follow this process where we preheat our dome, make sure we pass the hand test, then install our components, then start slowing down the fire by going to one finger and that fourth line. And then what we're going to do as we approach our 270 degree target temperature, we're going to start working our control tower top uh, every time we get within uh, a new sort of 25 degrees. So right now we're at 225 degrees. When I get to 250, I'll make an adjustment. And then when I get to 270, I'll make my last adjustment. And that is kind of like accelerating on the highway, right? If you were just to accelerate to 60 miles an hour and say, I want to be going 60 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden let off the accelerator, you would blow right past 60 miles an hour because you have momentum. Your grill is the same. So if you give too much momentum, you're going to really carry over uh, a lot of uh, momentum and have a hard time getting your temperatures back down. This is true if you start cooking, you know, too soon and you're not up to temperature. This is a bad analogy, but it's kind of like you were towing a trailer or something like that. It takes extra time for that weight and momentum to come up, but once it eventually catches up, you're going to shoot right past, which is normally if you find your temperatures are holding stable for an hour, two hours, and all of a sudden, you know, you see a straight line up and to the right. That's because your ceramics weren't either they were fully heat soaked or you were getting that cooling pocket from throwing the food on, uh, which is giving you a false temperature setting. You can avoid all of that by a good methodology in terms of how we build our heat, as well as trusting our vent settings that I'm gonna show you in a minute to make sure that this truly is a set it and forget it. We can walk away for a couple hour experience and not have to worry about runaway temperatures. Okay, you're not quite looking down, but we are at 250 degrees, angle's a little off on the camera. So I wanna make my last adjustment now because otherwise this will continue all the way up probably to about 350 degrees uh, on this line. So for 270 degrees, I'm gonna come right on this line and then make any minor adjustments. So we need a, tip, a touch more, the most that I would go is about an eighth inch to this side of the line. Uh, most likely I think we'll land about an eighth inch to the inside of our first line, right in line here with the M on the Kamado Joe logo. So as you can see, the advantage of that overnight dry brine is it gives the salt time to do its magic and penetrate deeply into the roast. Now, while this initially pulls out some moisture, as we subject this to heat, it's going to help retain more moisture overall, resulting in a more tender and juicy pulled pork. Plus, it really accentuates the natural pork flavor. And the salt, when it pulls out that moisture, acts as a binder and allows our rub to stick. So we didn't need any other supplemental binders. This, this rub is on here and not going anywhere. So I'm gonna track along with meter. You can use any probe system that you're comfortable with. I like meter for a couple of reasons. It works with the rotisserie, which I'm a big fan of. Plus since the app's been updated, it allows me to take notes and learn from my cooks. It's not every day sometimes that you do a brisket or a pulled pork. And so what went well, what didn't go well, uh, you can write that down and reference it in the future to say, uh, what do I wanna do next time I'm cooking one of these expensive cuts of meat? So all we're gonna do is just look for a spot. I'm gonna try and avoid the uh, the bone and I'm gonna go straight in what you uh, will find with the meter probe from an ambient sensor perspective if I was to go straight sideways and the probe is sitting right near the grill that's gonna give me more of a grill temperature I'm gonna get much much closer to the dome temperature if that's what I want to be tracking by going vertically and the worst thing you can do is go on a funny angle because if your probe sensor is sitting right near that cooling pocket of the meat itself you're not getting anything now you're not getting the great temperature you're not getting the dome temperature and really any sort of accurate information so we're going to go straight down again trying to avoid any bones looks good let's get this on Okay, our grill's up to temperature and holding nice and steady at 270 degrees. It took 23 minutes to get to this point. As you can tell, a little bit longer since I've been chatting 
uh, over there showing you how we're going to uh, set up for today's grill and cook. But that was a total time to be food ready, nice clean smoke, not seeing any billowy white stuff coming out of the grill. And it's been holding nice and steady here for about the last 20 minutes. So let's get this on. Okay, now that we've got our pulled pork on, let's take a minute to talk about the game plan for today's cook. A game plan is an incredibly important thing to have is that's gonna help inform the adjustments and the decisions that we make as we go along. So our target cook time or for dinner is to be shredding this up and enjoying it at 6.30 tonight. That means if I want a one hour rest, which is the minimum for a large roast like a pulled pork, this has to be done by 5.30 so that we can put that in our cooler and let it rest and help those juices redistribute. And so what I'm looking for here, where I'm gonna set the meter up is for 170 degrees Fahrenheit. This is just for the first stage of our smoke where we're gonna build our bark all the way around our pulled pork roast. Then, uh, depending on the time, and how close we are to that 530. I know in a foil boat, I can gain about 10 degrees Fahrenheit incremental you know, per hour. And in a full foil wrap, I can gain upwards of 20 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. The foil boat, I like for many reasons because it gives us all the benefit of a little bit of acceleration, but it allows that bark to continue to develop on top. It acts kind of like a warm sweater where you know you help trap some of that heat, but we still get the benefit of building that bark, plus protecting from the bottom where even in a double indirect, our heat source in a Kamado style grill is all coming up from the bottom. So that's my game plan today. We're gonna go foil boat, we're gonna plan for a minimum of a one hour rest. And so our work back schedule means that we're gonna to have to make some decisions if we need to speed up or slow down somewhere around two to 3 p.m. this afternoon as it's 11 right now. So what we're gonna do for the couple hours in between, well, we're gonna do nothing for the first hour for a few reasons, it doesn't need anything. And I'm going out to do some Saturday morning errands. And then when we come back, we're going to start adding some wood chips into that bottom ash drawer. I know those two pieces of wood from previous experience will last about one hour. And after that, they're fully consumed and we're getting no more smoke. So if we wanna add a couple more pieces of smoking wood, we're going to use the ash drawer hack and just add a couple wood chips or small splits in there every hour. And then for spray, I'm gonna use apple cider vinegar uh, diluted with a little bit of water just to help keep the outside uh, moist and nothing burning, as well as just helping impart a little bit of that acid and, and rendered fat flavor that's going to complement our sauce when we build that later on. So I'll rejoin you in a little bit when we've got some updates and adjustments to our game plan for today's Pulled Pork 101. So one of the advantages of the double indirect is that we're burning a nice clean hot fire. So after an hour or so, we'll get some of these coals and embers falling through our charcoal basket. So I just wanna find where those coals are because that's where I'm gonna place our wood chips. Grab a handful, toss them right in, put it back, and then back to one finger. Okay, quick update, as you can tell, we are back. So we're about four and a half hours in, so it's just sitting past 3.30 local time, and we are nearly at that 170 that we set our meter up to be able to foil boat this. So family's done a great job keeping the spray and the wood chips going, but looking at the color, I think we can start to now bump that heat and get our bark a little bit crispier. It's been cooking nice and evenly and smoking really well all morning long up to this point, but I want to now start to get a little bit more texture in our shred when we mix it all together. So to do that, I'm just gonna bump over our control tower top to the middle spot between the first and the second line. And that should bring our temperatures now up into about that 330 to max sort of 350 degrees Fahrenheit is where I want to be for this last portion of our cook. I'll rejoin you once we transfer our pulled pork into the foil boat. Okay, so it's time to transfer our pork to a boat. So just for handling that, I like to grab some inexpensive cotton gloves that'll add a little bit of heat protection and uh, nitrile gloves that'll just give us some food safe protection. Now have a safe 35% coat on these if you're looking for a good pair, I'll link to that down below. Let's get this off. Oh, look at that. That color smells awesome. So we'll just try and manage our drips here carefully.
Perfect. And then for making the boat, we're just going to try, like a sweater that only covers the outside, wrap this up as tight as we can all the way around. That's going to help now start to save some of the fat that renders out. So it's brazing in that. Plus we'll have that later when we shred it to help make sure everything's moist and juicy. Take it fast forward while we wrap this up. Looks good. Back on it goes. Okay, it is time to get our pork off and let it rest for the next hour. The challenge with saying something early in the day is this needs to be off at 5.30 for a one hour rest. I think I missed it by about five minutes. At 5.32, meter was reading 197. Let's go check it for probe feel elsewhere with our thermopen and see if it is indeed ready. Otherwise, I think we're maybe about five minutes short of our goal time. So instead of 6.30, we'll do 6.35. No big deal in terms of barbecue. That's pretty good on the money. I'll take it. So let's go check it out for probe feel and tenderness. All right, let's take a look. Ooh, that is a thing of beauty so let's check what we're looking here we already have we know the temperature from our meter probe uh, what we want to see is that feel so that right there still feels a little tight so at the back we're getting about 199 200 so the temperatures are good but this is not quite the feel that i'm looking for so we might do a couple degrees more i'm trying to avoid the bone here, but this feels like it could use, oh, that, that part's good, right above the bone. What we wanna see everywhere is when we drop in is that when I release the probe, is it just as that on its own, it just sort of falls, falls right, <laughs> right through our pork. So I'm gonna give this another five minutes. Uh, like we guessed, I think we're nearly there and then we'll get this off and let it rest. All right, a couple minutes later and our pork is done. So let's remove the meter probe. It's done its job. And I'm just going to transfer to a foil pan. Then we're gonna cover this up, wrap that in a towel and get it in a cooler. Take the fast forward for that. Well, since we have an hour for our pork to rest, this is more than enough time to make up some amazing North Carolina style vinegar sauce. So come nice and close. All you need is apple cider vinegar, ketchup, Dijon mustard, some brown sugar, some salt, some red pepper flakes, and I'm gonna mispronounce this one, Worcestershire sauce. If I say it quick enough, maybe it sounded close. Anyways, you'll get the idea. I'll put the exact amount up on screen. So let's make up our sauce. About 15 minutes later of whisking it, it'll be ready to go. Okay, our pulled pork looks amazing and it's all I could do to lift it out of the foil boat and move it to this uh, cutting board so it, without it falling apart, let's come nice and close, shred into it. Okay, let's start, see if we can find our bone here. Give that a pull. Oh, almost came out perfect clean. Just one more, one more tug, a few stubborn pieces of bark, but I'd say that's a nice clean pull on our bone. And this is just fall apart tender. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna transfer this to our foil pan right over here and actually do the rest of this by fork. All right, let's shred this up. So this is shredding incredible. The aroma is amazing. My mouth is watering, I can't wait to taste. So I've got a little bit of sauce. Now, I'm not gonna pour all of this in. We like to set some of this aside. You're making sandwiches, guests can add more or less. We don't wanna take away too much from the flavor of the pork. So when you do make up your sauce, don't go ahead and just completely drench it in sauce. But I'm gonna give a little bit here just cause I know I like it. Dabble do ya. Let's see how we did. Mm. Oh, that was the perfect bite. I got, as we're shredding, I'm like to trying to mix all those pieces together. So we get some of our bark, which is giving us just a little bit of that pop of heat and salt and sweetness. And then you get the sort of the warmth of the the rendered fat just coats your tongue and takes away some of that heat. And then with that little dab of sauce, the apple cider vinegar just sort of like cuts right through and gives a nice refreshing, I want to do it again, type bite. 
So this is one of the reasons why pulled pork is on my first five cooks, plus or minus the five minutes that I was off on our guest this morning. This is very predictable in terms of cook times, uh, very forgiving if you need, uh, or if your temperatures get away from you, a little bit too high, too low. And I hope that this one-on-one video where we pulled together all of our latest, greatest tips and techniques, whether it's the dry brine, the foil boat, the double indirect, hot and fast, really just brings everything together to make an incredible family meal or one that you can share with uh, friends and neighbors alike. That's it for today though. I'm James from Smoking Dead Barbecue signing off. If you like this video, please let YouTube know by smashing that thumbs up button and let me know by hitting subscribe. Until next time, don't be afraid to fire it up.